Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm very excited for our second um, ASCIA webinar and a very warm welcome, welcome to InterWest. I'm really looking forward to your presentation on uh, many levels, specifically the environmental components. Of course, I'm biased in that direction. But uh, welcome, Kate and team. And um, before I hand over to Gary to introduce your entry, just a, a reminder, um, this is the second year of the Africa Supply Chain Excellence Awards and um, offer a very successful awards event last year. We're really looking forward to maintain the momentum for 2023. And I really would like to encourage you to, if you have a, a story to share with us on your supply chain successes, your case studies, please um, enter. You can go to www.askia.co.za and um, entries close at the 28th of March. We have a phenomenal judging panel ready and waiting to um, share their expertise with you and to guide you through the entry process. And we're really excited to a great uh, 2023. I think it has the year has started off quite a challenge with all the load shedding um, challenges that we've all been facing. Um, but I think being in supply chain, we're used to um, adapting. And um, yeah, I think it's, it's going to be an interesting year ahead for sure. Um, it is my great, great pleasure to introduce to you the chairperson of our judging committee, Gary Marshall. Gary, welcome. And I'd like to hand over to you uh, to introduce uh, Kate and the team. Over to you. Uh, just a, a quick um, housekeeping. Questions, please ask your questions um, and we'll pose them to the team at the end of the presentation. And just a, rem a reminder to mute yourself um, during the presentation. Thank you very much. Over to you, Gary. Yeah, one of the nice things about being online is that when you do your MC thing, Liesl, you don't have to say the toilets are down that away and to the left and so <laughs> yes, on. Yes, so or it will be an air host test for yeah. the emergency exit. So good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thanks, uh, thanks for joining. I um, would just like to give you an overview, uh, not of the entry itself, um, because I don't want to steal the team's um, thunder, but to give you um, the judges' views on why we thought this entry was, uh, was excellent and why it did well. I think the first thing is that it takes a lot of courage to enter into a competition like this and sort of open your kimono to strangers and particularly us bunch of geezers that have been around a long time and uh, kind of cynical about stuff, you know, so it does take courage. Um, and we're very, very aware of that. And also, when we look at the thing, we're also very aware of the fact that often the entrants are kind of concentrating on the main point of the entry. You know, the old saying of the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And so what we look for often is what, is, what are the issues behind the entry? What are the other things that they haven't brought to our attention? that um, can make a difference to the entry. So if you look at this particular one, as you'll see, it looks on the surface of it uh, uh, like a, a transport entry, transport related system entry where an organization which had done really well in a really tough market over a long period of time had a kind of a decentralized structure, uh, sorry, sorry, a decentralized structure um, was a bit with archaic systems in place as to how they, um, approached their business and measured their business and so on. When we looked at it, what didn't come through on the entry itself was the work behind the scenes or certainly highlighting the work behind the scenes. And in this particular one, there were some lovely stuff. So for example, what is not highlighted, but you can imagine when you go through the entry is the change management that was required to make this work. And the impact that that has on all levels within the organization, including top management. So it goes from a structural change from uh, decentralized um, management where the local management of the various sites are their own kings, and those are their kingdoms. And along comes these smart ass guys, and they decide that uh, you need to have a single system, can be measured centrally, you can um, benchmark it centrally and so on. But that's a massive cultural change that has to take place. Um, and so that for us in the background was an appreciation 
of the job that was done to effect change um, beyond what they will just show you. And so people always are what makes an entry or not makes an entry, but makes a project successful or, or fail. We all know that. So in this particular instance, taking this company, which was very set in its ways, it was successful, but taking the company into the modern era was more than just introducing systems and, and so on. It actually involved a lot of pain, a lot of people management, and I think they did an absolutely great job. So without sort of any further ado, we liked the entry because not only did they do a great job, but not only did they transform the company into a new era, but also they actually made an impact on all of their people and, and brought them into a new era. Um, and that's, that's a big ask. So um, we liked it. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Over to you, Kate. Sorry, thanks, Liesl, um, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, just going to share my screen. Please let me know when you can see it. Yeah, see it, perfect. Okay, great. Um, so uh, before I start, just maybe a quick introduction to myself and Duran, who are going to be presenting to you. So I'm Kate Stubbs. Um, <laughs> We all have many roles. My official title is Group Marketing and Business Development Director. Um, so um, I've been part of this journey of um, sharing or communicating the success of our change management. But my role started, um, I joined the business to lead up the sales environment. And so um, some context to, to trying to service customers and uh, um, deal with queries um, in a very challenging environment. So I started this, this journey actually that we talked to you about today started about five years ago. Um, so my context that, uh, in part of this journey was that change management of when ensuring that we offer the clients services that we promise, but enhancing them and having visibility uh, to continue to enhance not only the service, but the market perception of the business. And then Duran, who will get into the detail of what we actually did is the general manager um, for our logistics division. He's responsible for optimization and quality control. But he also at the start of this journey was a depot manager. So he lived on the coal face of change management. And actually, Gary, as we were sitting here, I said to Duran, sure, your role has also changed since we started this journey. I said, do you find it easy or not? And he said, well, it's different because yeah, when he was a depot manager, he had control, he had his team and he could do what he liked. And now he's part of trying to um, lead the charge and be the, the smartest people we have to provide guidance to all our, our depot managers across regions. So it's certainly, uh, the, the challenges remain, they're just different, um, but we are grateful for the opportunity to share our story with us. So just a quick intro to, to Interwaste from my side. Um, we're a waste management business. Um, we, we actually were proudly South African, started by an entrepreneur um, in 1989. And as Gary said, we were an incredibly entrepreneurially run business. We started with, uh, Alan Wilcox started the business with literally a truck, himself, his wife, and a driver, and, and slowly grew the business into, to, up into 2019 when we were acquired by the Sesha Environment Group. So we developed our services from just offering basic transport and disposal of waste to um, aligning to where the legislation has changed in South Africa and it continues to change to offering what we call a full service of waste management solutions. Um, so we typically would go to a customer, understand what waste is, align it to legal compliance. A lot of waste needs to be assessed from a, from a chemical component. So the lab testing um, to understand the strategy and then to offer the treatment, processing, disposal, recovery of waste through our own own facilities or other third party facilities. And, and a large part of waste management specifically in South Africa and a large part of the cost is transportation, the collection and transportation. And hence the, the, the logistics side of waste management is actually quite complex. I came from a, a long background in supply chain management and logistics. So when I came here, I thought, well, this is easy. I know that part of the business. Um, but I think you'll learn is waste management logistics is very different to some of our standard logistics. Um, we have a strong uh, 
purpose of serving land and life and protecting the environment. We have a zero harm philosophy and that's zero harm in, from a safety and an environmental perspective. We are fully accredited in licensing, a license, and that comes from how you treat and manage waste, as well as there's specific licensing for transporting waste. Um, we are nationally, we have a national footprint. At the moment, we have over 1,700 employees in South Africa. We do have a large fleet of different types of waste, waste handling equipment. We're a level one business, a BE company, and we service a wide range of industries, predominantly private sector and multinational industries. So anything from oil and gas, FMCG, retail, pharmaceutical, um, some logistics companies, we do SARS, we do safe destruction of products. So we do handle a large variety of industries and different types of waste types. So it's quite, um, and each has their own specific requirements. Um, that's our footprint. So as I said, we have a national footprint and um, we do have our own in certain areas, treatment and processing facilities, um, but we also then do work with third party providers. Um, just a quick one on the waste management industry, because um, I suppose like many of us, we challenge with some of uh, a lot of the shifts happening in the country, but globally, all of us are being faced with a greater focus on sustainability climate change, decarbonization. I think there's a, there's a massive focus on our environmental footprint, on ESG and on, on the E of that, the environmental side. I think on the social and governance side, a lot of businesses have been focused on those elements, but obviously the E part is there too now, the environmental impact. And that's where waste comes in too, is that companies are being um, are much more aware uh, and need to learn and be much more um, accountable for the waste that they generate. And, and when we talk waste, there's a physical material waste, but we also talk waste of energy, waste of water, all types of processes. I think there's just a, a much larger awareness of making sure that we operate um, as effectively as possible, because obviously, I mean, cost comes into waste as well. From, a, from an industry perspective, there's rising competition. Um, we have rising costs and our costs are associated to, I mean, in the logistics industry, we've seen what's happened with the fuel price, but there's wage costs, labor costs, and then there's a cost of, of treatment and disposal of waste. Because the legislation is changing, and literally every year, more and more waste types are banned from landfill disposal, our disposal costs and waste treatment costs are often far in excess of CPI or wherever the, what, wherever the market is at. So for instance, when liquid waste was banned from landfill disposal in 2019, the cost in most disposal facilities went up 60%. Now you've got to go to your clients and say, there's a 60% increase. So, so the cost of compliance and the, and, and the cost of change is quite, um, that just adds a whole lot of complexity to, to, uh, to the waste management industry. And also I think from a client perspective, interesting to note is we, we, ha we have some national contracts and a good example is it costs double to dispose of waste in the city of Cape Town versus the rest of the country. And that's because they just have very limited facilities currently available, um, the long lead times and the cost of disposal is double anywhere else in the country. Now, when you're dealing with customers, you need to explain that in Gauteng, for instance, it may cost you 350 Rand a ton to dispose of general waste when the Western Cape is 650 Rand. So you've got to balance um, those levels of complexity. As I said, the, um, not only are clients um, evolving quickly, the legislation continues to evolve, and there's lots of um, new technologies coming on the market. So it's an exciting space to be in. Um, but what you do need in order to, to be able to survive in this space is, is a base in which to make quick decisions or scenario planning. And I think that's the crux of the start of our journey. Uh, Gary mentioned we were in quite an archaic, very entrepreneurial face business um, where everyone sort of did their own thing. There weren't standard operating procedures, and I'm stealing some of Duran's thunder, um, but we needed to shift the business in order to cope with the, this ever-changing environment. So I will let Duran take you through our challenges and what we did to, to solve those. Thank you, Kate. Thank you to Sia and all attendees. Um, as Kate explained, the, the external waste management landscape and the challenge that, that internal waste faced. Uh, we saw the problem statement and the complexity of the operations looking inward. Uh, what we're going to take you through. 
sorry, is the four lenses of the complexity. So we look at the client industry characteristics, corporate culture, waste legislation, and the waste logistics complexity. So into waste services, 2,397 clients over 4,000 locations, providing 9,837 unique service offerings in a heavy regulated environment. Um, so with those bills, uh, requirements, we range from your blue chips, FMCG, Petrochem, to your residential clients. So we face, that, face those changes on a daily basis. In, to, in terms of corporate culture, where we were, each depot was independently run and had autonomy. Depots were action orientated and results driven, derived from rapid growth in preceding years from a very entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial business, as Kate mentioned. Um, in terms of touching on the waste legislation, the new regulations coming into effect, most notably the liquid waste um, restrictions in 2019 and the new effects of the extended producer responsibility. Fourth, you know, is the basic core of the subject, the operations. So how waste logistics is fundamentally different from your traditional FMCG and long haul. In a 24 to 48 hour period, from a booking to order completion or for disposal, the following is processed. So you've got your three different client service requests. Um, it's called on-call, tele-exchange, and on-site driven. Your on-call, which is your ad hoc client requests, so they'll phone any time, versus your set exchange, which is scheduled, um, come every Wednesday, Thursday, every second month, versus your on-site management driven, which is an individual at a client site requesting a service. So you get your three different uh, service requests, your four different service types performed. So you get your exchange, your return exchange, um, your uplift and your placement. Going through them, exchanges are an immediate exchange of the current bin on site with the new bin. The return exchange is taking the bin away from the client, dumping or disposing and bringing that same bin back. Uplift is taking the bin away and placement is putting a bin there where a bin didn't exist in the first place. So with that, there's 10 different vehicle types and over 40 different waste receptacle types, which cater for the 88 different waste streams, which are further separated into the three formats of waste. So you get your solid, your sludge, and your liquid. And with that, taken to the various disposal facilities um, for the 18,318 unique and active pricing lines. So looking at that, into waste deliver those services over 9 million kilometers are achieved per annum and 4 million liters of fuel used. So taking us through that, we'll explore the problem statement. And the problem statement, um, we assess it in, in four different areas. So the elements of the problem statement were the lack of visibility of depot activities, the ability to gauge depot performance, the inability to proactively diagnose problem areas, the lack of uniformity of system adoption and operational metrics, and manual paper-based processes, which were unstructured and inaccurate in terms of planning and scheduling. So this translates further to the various services that Interways provide. As Kate showed you, and what we call the wheel of wonder, um, these are the what is taken into consideration when applying a new service and structure. Further to that, this, these are the various different vehicles that Interways use to perform those um, services. So this visual example displays the waste logistic vehicles, addresses the various formats, formats of waste. So you get your compact, compactable waste with both your, both your front end loader and rear end loader vehicles, your low volume high SG products in the form of skips and sidesippers, your high volume low SG in the form of Roros, and liquids and sludges in the, in the form of 30 kiloliters and vacuum tanking solutions. So this is what we're using to show how different the FMCG and traditional long haul is from your waste logistics. So with this, we have included your recycling vehicles where there is quite a, a range of vehicles. So it's worth noting that the, the vehicle range in offering the solutions that these bins and vehicles are not interchangeable mm -hmm. and the bin remains on site when the vehicle disappears. It can. Um, and those bins and formats of vehicles are dependent on the waste stream format, as you said, solid liquid sludge, and the risk in providing that service. 
moving forward to the analysis. <clears throat> so brief overview on the analysis. Both a top-down and bottom-up analysis was conducted, resulting in the five inside areas. Right. Firstly, the review of the waste facilities and waste logistics divisions, previously run similarly, but significantly different, different businesses which were reviewed and the potential for segregation was conducted. Secondly, and this brought a broader transition in 2019 and 2010, introducing a revised transport focused logistic structure. Thirdly, each logistics activity was reviewed at a granular level, assessing the information flow from a single service order through to your ERP system to develop solutions able to be fit for purpose and scaled across the operation. Fourth, the traditional legacy boards or planning boards, which many in the transport industry, industry might be familiar with was manual and reliant on a tacit knowledge of the controllers and then knowledge of their clients, right? In answering the planning complexity, we moved to a digital planning platform. After testing several systems, we found that those systems were inefficient and in terms of dealing with the complexity of waste logistics. In answering the evolving requirements of the operation, live reporting and digitalization, a more comprehensive solution was required. So that's just an overview of the, the insights uh, delving into the, the analysis. The six areas uh, touched on multiple facets of the business. <clears throat> so we looked at strategy, what was the new direction? So a strategic review to increase automation by providing visibility, development of key performance indicators and operation-wide compliance was the objective. Secondly, people, a cultural shift was required to reframe the culture. A review of the decentralized management structure, management systems, and performance management measures were reviewed towards increasing employee development, compliance, and reduction of risk. Thirdly, internal processes, how we did things. So reviews of all depot processes and procedures in collaborative forums was investigated. The lack of diagnostic tools and operation vis visibility in both reviewing depot processes and adherence and daily activity performance and benchmarking individual depots and vehicles on more transport related metrics. Moving on to our fourth um, analysis area, systems. So we focused on system requirements and current system adoption to produce quantifiable measurements tied to the usage and performance. System development required specialized internal systems um, to be developed by in-house development team to align all the systems to be centered around a per kilometer base, which were quite fortunate um, for. Logistics scheduling, planning and routing, plan your drive, drive your plan, your provision of a structured system, driven planning and optimization tool, transition away from the manual and human dependency, reducing the slow and inaccurate reporting, <clears throat> as well as the provision of a feedback mechanism to measure planned versus actual trip execution and provide depot logistics performance insights were required. Lastly, the on the road risk performance analysis addressed three dimensions. Firstly, the review of the on the road events. Secondly, the provision of a structured driver training program. And thirdly, the ability to leverage the use of telematics to reduce on the road risk. So with the analysis concluded, the conclusion was, that not one single system would work, but rather a bouquet of integrated digital solutions and change in management frameworks was required. So in answering the analysis, <clears throat> the solution was constructed. So the six problem areas created the six integrate solu integrated solution themes. So what we looked at is providing those solutions to underpin the solution before it. And that's why you have that iterative approach and that figure eight on the right hand side. So how those systems work together and improve each other as they move forward and as the system develops and matures. So with that, the new uh, solution theme one, the new strategy and change in management structure. So that was the alignment of people and culture. A centralized management structure change was initiated from a regional director to operations director and addition of a GM layer which included FM and QA roles, coupled with regional segregation based on geographic and spectral specifications, namely the petrochem and mining focused operations. 
Secondly, the implementation of standardized integrated management systems added three elements. <clears throat> the daily operations activity focus checklist, measuring 17 depot activities. Secondly, the introduction of different manager balance scorecards. And thirdly, annual vehicle condition auditing and benchmarking. Third, the standardized processes, processes and activities. The revision of all SOPs for depot vehicles, operational processes, administrative functions were revised and on previous years' incidents, industry best practice and institutional collaboration provided the framework. Fourth, the standardized systems focused on providing web-based access to operational tools in a consolidated area. Secondly, an internal developed asset management system to manage fuel, vehicles, and kilometer inputs. And lastly, a digital view of financial reporting, consolidation, and visualization of KPIs. Fifth, your route planning and optimization tool. So we introduced a, a native waste management routing and optimization tool to yield improved operating profits through the reduction of kilometers, uh, operational, operational costs through <clears throat> reduction of kilometers and time travel. Whilst offering web-based live operational execution management um, in terms of real-time reporting of plan versus actual kilometers done. Lastly, your on-the-road risk management tools, driver training focus on green band driving, uniformity of telematics, a single vehicle tracking system with customized reporting to reduce your speeding vehicle idling and harsh braking events. And lastly, on the onboard driver event management tools. So to be the eyes on the road, as it was say, and overall reduction in driver risk. So we're going to take you through the examples of these solutions. The first example is your digital daily submission by the depots. This submission encapsulates an operations meeting which accommodates all your daily checks, daily tasks, operational reviews, which are addressed by each depot. And this is secondly, your pre-trips, client requests, and daily driver debriefs <clears throat> conducted on a daily basis. Secondly, um, an example of our consolidated area. So this is a web-based platform where we host all of our operational tools in a central area, ensuring document control, as well as depot KPR visibility to review the revenue per K, CPK, fuel consumption, and maintenance entire CPK on a daily basis. In terms of implementation, <clears throat> we move forward, there were four key areas that, that stood out while we were busy with this implementation, um, which we noted. So those areas were firstly, as Kate says, it takes time. So this was a lot of time in the making uh, to get to this point where we pulled the trigger and released all these solutions at once. Like testing the groundwork, but a lot of the projects were self-selected and with the timing, it was people. So people, culture. As depots were previously autonomous, the project success was hinged on the individual depot leadership and reliance on project champions. The overall shift of a kilometer-based reporting and alignment of the various operations centered around the scorecard introduction throughout all operational levels and through to the subordinate levels. Secondly, relevance, applicability, and adoption by depots as waste transport is fundamentally different from your traditional FMCG and long haul, so too is each operation from each other. So no two operations are the same. The same make, model of vehicles, and same sector, near identical, but all other variables were different. Solutions required iterative and structured flexible approaches, heavily reliant on internal development and customizable solutions to scale across the Venice regions. Thirdly, the iterative testing provided by the Gauteng centralized depots was invaluable in improving and testing, including the stakeholder input, which increased employee engagement and development. Um, so with that, the Gauteng depot was the, the guinea pig in terms of all this iterative testing that occurred and using that stakeholder input to develop those systems further. In terms of fourth reporting, in communicating project data accuracy and credibility, Displaying success relied heavily on dashboards and visualizations to display the performance of the various depots. So in seeing 
timeline for the various implementation and projects. As you can see, firstly, the on-risk management tool, which was done prior to the 1st of January 2021. Secondly, the asset management program, again, 2021, Jan. Scorecards introduced at the beginning of 2021. Uh, Power BI reporting, <clears throat> daily operation checklist starting in July. SharePoint, finding the tools and the SOP in their and operational processes. And that leads me to introduce the, the team um, that made this all possible. Uh, so it's with great pleasure that uh, I introduced the team. And the, the team involved was everyone in Interwaste. So it was a collective effort and continued efforts by each and every individual in the Interwaste staff. And that brings me through to the results. And Kate's going to take us through the, the results. Thank you, Kate. So that, <clears throat> thanks, Duran. I mean, it's funny going through this again, um, because as Gary said, the change management, the, the pain. So the last two years were a lot more of the technical implementation, but the three years prior to that were a lot of the engagement with um, staff at various levels, from drivers where we were putting in technology where they felt, you know, the, the likes of drive cam, where we, we dealt with the culture change of you spying on me, we're not spying on you, showing them the benefit of how it actually protects them. Um, so that type of change management to depot managers who were used to running their show and felt now that they were being told what to do or micromanage to finance people, to, to HR people, to all levels of people um, and the engagement that was required in, in, in trying to sell the vision and trying to explain why, the why we were doing this. I think personally from my side, when I started, um, I'm going to say it as raw it is, as it is, I don't think I've ever been shouted at by so many clients in my life. Um, just because they say, where's your truck? When, when are you coming? And I'd phone a depot. We just did not have that visibility. We would service them and maybe that day, but I couldn't say if the truck was on its way or, you know, it took five phone calls to find out what was going on. And I think where we are today with, with all the online tools, most of our customers are getting a, an SMS notification, your truck's on the way. We just have... How, how, how the technology and the, the shift in thinking and operating has fundamentally changed our ability to, to service our clients um, and also empower our own people. Um, so as much as the change was hard in the beginning, I, I, there are so much, we are all so much more empowered um, with the knowledge and the access of information that we now have. But what was really pleasing to see, as I said, I was shouted at a lot being head of sales about customer service and one of, the, one of the reasons, one of the reasons we did this was obviously to improve customer service. And so we, you know, we had, we, we it's easy to complain um, and we're all good at complaining, but it's really lovely when we started, we started getting these types of comments and, and from a wide range of customers, just, you know, thank you for the service, excellent delivery. We were able to respond faster to deal with crises. Um, and a lot of customers said that seen, that felt that impact. Um, uh, we had external people also just saying, you know, uh, we can see the, the change in your driver behavior on the roads. So it, it was really heartening to see that. And, you know, some of our, our customer service level, this is from our customer, independent customer service um, report, you know, impeccable service, keep up the good work. And yeah, we still have challenges, but we're also able to deal with those a lot faster now. And I think that's, that's as important in being accessible and reliable. I just think Maybe one more thing from the customer side is we have an online portal. So we changed, I mean, the, their ability to view their own reports. I, mean, I spoke earlier about sustainability and the focus on ESG. Well, a large part of what our clients need is, is management information. So they're able to access a portal 24 seven where they can download their raised reports. They can look at their invoices. They can get any type of access to, to their relevant documentations as well as place service delivery order request direct through one portal, which, which does facilitate um, their sort of engagement with us. Um, and then from obviously, I mean, so that's my customer side, um, but from an operational side, um, some significant improvements. Thank you, Kate. Uh, moving on to the financial results. Um, and, and as Kate mentioned, you know, client centricity is, is one of our most important um, values at Interwaste, um, looking at the financial results is how well we did in that period. So here we go 
in terms of the improved profitability, reduction of operational costs through the reduction of kilometers time and peak utilization, we achieved a 12.4% increase per transaction on your ready per K. So this is with the reduction of kilometers, greater optimization of planning and increased payloads, a 6.1% fuel consumption improvement through the vehicle optimization and transitioning from single diff to double diffs, and then a CPA maintenance reduction of 5.5% and a CPK tire reduction of 3.4% for the period. Moving on to our operational results. So operation, operational results are your two intangibles, so, um, which are just as important as your finances. The 50%, more than a 50% reduction in risk events, event severity, and total risk reduction in terms of our on the road um, risk, and then a 92% reduction in your speeding events per month. In the dimension of people and culture, employees were more empowered, felt engaged, which was supported by a more balanced and safety conscious culture and the alignment of, of staff towards the goals. <clears throat> it was displayed through the responses from the various operational teams and shown through the 4% increase achieved in internal audits for the period, which you could see the buy-in, feel the buy-in. And thirdly, optimized routing and planning, increased and more reliable service delivery was achieved, which allowed region-wide visibility and service order level tracking, accurate real-time reporting, increased operational efficiencies and kilometer reduction provided greater visibility and insights to daily productivity. An example is the independent report received, uh, as, as Kate mentioned, DriveCam and our overall uh, reduction in risk for the period for total logistics or on the road risk. Handing over to Kate to take us through on the way forward for Insight. Thanks, Duran. So it doesn't end there. I think that's what uh, it was good to, to to pause and reflect on what we had achieved. And now I think we we feel we, we, we've created a solid base of which to grow. As I said, the market changes, we all have been to adapt consistently and continuously and remain competitive. So um, from an <clears throat> from an environmental perspective, <clears throat> sorry, um, we have at a group level a decarbonization strategy. Um, and the focus on biodiversity. So, sorry, um, this contributes directly to that because we're able to measure our carbon footprints in our logistics division and put and contribute to our decarbonization initiatives. So, we have a variety of um, projects underway <clears throat> from fuel consumption to continual optimization of kilometers as well as looking at new technologies like the Euro 3 to the Euro 5. We're also piloting electric vehicles. So I think we've got a good base and uh, the data available to measure our performance in this regard. Um, and then from a driver engagement, I mean, we all know you can have fancy technology, um, but people still make your business work. And we are hugely people-driven business. We have a large fleet with a lot of drivers and assistant drivers. So educating them, motivating them, and empowering them is critical to our success. So we, we launched Roadstars at the uh, middle of last year. It's a, a specific driver engagement campaign, which is focused on not only incentivizing them, but um, to educate them and empower them on all these elements of training and customer service and safety. And, and they each have their individual scorecards. They have an objective. Uh, what's beautiful with all the technology is it's not a depot manager telling them how they perform that day. They get their digital scorecard daily. So they get an objective view of their performance and um, our driver trainers assist them. So that's that really shifted our culture in terms of how, how our drivers and our assistants in the logistics area service our customers. They also have technology and we, we're rolling out sign on glass and that type of technology which empowers them to also take photos of potential challenges and report immediately back to, to the depot manager if we have any challenges in servicing our clients. So there's, there's a still a lot more work to be done, but I think we've, we've set ourselves up, uh, we developed a good base of which to grow into the future. So yeah, I think we, we, we're pleased with where we're at and, and our solutions are about remaining economically viable, being socially conscious, safety is massive, 
um, and um, managing our risks uh, in terms of uh, having a lot of vehicles out on the road, uh, transporting hazardous and non-hazardous goods. We need to be really conscious about those things. And then obviously from an environmental perspective, being sustainable and, and being sound, that we, don't, that we can minimize our impact on the environment. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Um, and Duran, that was brilliant, as um, I really enjoyed that one a lot. Um, so we've got one uh, question so far from uh, Sepo, and then we'll go around the room and see if anyone wants to just raise their hands and um, ask a question. Um, Sepo asks, does interwaste render the service of medical waste treatment and disposal? And if they do, what is the treatment technology? So we don't. Um... Sorry, I've, can you hear me? Yes. We don't. Um, so we don't um, treat medical waste as such. That most medical waste is incinerated. We handle pharmaceutical waste. Schedules one to four, where we can we have a safe destruction facility where that is carefully monitored and and safely depackaged and processed. From a medical waste perspective, we do we can assist clients. But typically that's going to go into, and there's a specific packaging regulation and that's moved in sealed buckets to incineration. So our medical waste is, um, we, don't, we don't own our own incinerators. Okay, awesome. Uh, is there anyone who would like to ask a question? Do you wanna raise your hand and then um, I could ask the question. So, really, Kate and your own fascinating case study. Um, I um, just here locally, we had waste collection uh, done, and I was just, it's, it's amazing how it reduces your, your average household waste significantly. Um, we used to have two bins, and then we went down to one bin, sometimes half a bin. And um, it, it's really great. You feel like you're contributing, and it's managed really well here through uh, the municipality. And it's really such an important thing. I read the other day, you know, everything has to go somewhere. <laughs> it doesn't just disappear. It has to go somewhere. And that somewhere has to be a responsible somewhere that doesn't impact our environment uh, negatively. And obviously, uh, staying in Cape Town with the oceans, it's amazing the kind of waste that we see on a daily basis in our oceans. It's quite tragic, actually. Just general household waste options. So fantastic case study, really intricate, um, loved it. And... Um, well done. Thank you so, so much. I'm just going to hand over to Gary for some uh, closing comments. Yeah, another one. Thank you, Liesl. Um, and thanks, Kate, um, and your team. Um, well, the one thing I didn't mention at the beginning is this, this, is all, this is not only an evaluation of supply chain improvement, it's also a competition. And mm -hmm. so to be fair to everybody, the presenters only have about 20 minutes in which to present. And when you've got something like this, which, what did it go, Kate, five years, four years? What was the- Yeah, five, at least five years. Yeah, so, so now you had a five-year program with, first of all, um, I, I seem to recall you mentioned, there's like a three-year preparation almost in getting people ready and culture ready and stuff like that. Um, and then, you know, the implementation uh, itself. And to put all of this, I mean, you were talking um, at a at a heck of a rate there to try and get through this five year um, story because that's what it is, you know. And it was a great story. So we, as judges, of course, also had the luxury of being able to spend another twenty minutes asking you questions to get a deeper understanding of the thing, you know, which um, led us to the conclusion about the century. But I think anybody can tell. This is a great job. And Kate, I, as, as I've mentioned to you before, you know, I live in an area which has a, um, one of your waste sites. And a few years ago, I was, when I saw one of your trucks coming down the road, I, I would duck. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they were arrogant, they were rude, they were aggressive as all heck. And we don't see that anymore, N nothing. I mean, so just from a, a user on the road, from a safety perspective, I can personally vouch for the fact that there's been a, you know, a radical change in the whole in the whole approach. So, from our side as judges, again, thanks for opening your kimono to us, um, sharing your story, and um, 
good luck because as we all know uh, it doesn't end here yeah thank you thank you thanks very much and thanks uh, thank you to everyone for your time and for listening Awesome. Thank you so much, Kate and Duran. Thanks, everybody. And um, just a reminder, our entry dates close on the 28th of March, and we'd really like to hear from you. Um, and we've, um, we're have we looking forward to 2023 and more phenomenal stories like this one. But uh, thanks again, guys. That was really a great presentation.